So thank you very much for um, coming. I hope that this won't be too great a, a burden on you. I will try to make this as, as painless as possible. Uh, the subject is a little odd uh, from the perspective of law and even odder from the perspective of human rights and perhaps even odder still from the perspective of business. So I've got a set of oddities all around uh, which add up to the reality of emerging practices uh, which we will have to deal with and which will by its very nature and reality force us all to begin rethinking the nice, simple, static notions and premises that tend to underlie and protect our various fields, um, our various academic fields um, going forward because this is a, this is a, a very small slice of a very large set of changes in the realities of governance in the nature of public and private enterprises in the allocation of both governance on one end from the state to non-state actors but also of economic authority up from economic entities to the state. It's a very strange world we're living in. And I'm going to do it from, from an even odder lens. I'm going to do a second order the, the rise of second order responsibilities within a fairly odd complex of new governance intersections. And so that's the, the title of the paper, of this paper, The Financial Sector Responsibility uh, for Human Rights Conduct of Borrowers. And, and I'm going to focus because there's nothing worse than doing nothing but talking abstractions. I'm going to try to focus on something concrete and what could be more deliciously concrete in terms of finding evildoers and uh, victims and, and dragons and princesses and princes and stuff than the extractive sector, which is, which is just a marvelous uh, place to do. So that's, that's the, the purpose of this thing. So we're looking at the human rights conduct of borrowers, the responsibility of another set of private actors, some private actors, some public actors, this is the financial sector, banks, development, both public and private banks, um, and in a particular context, which is uh, a one in which there are any number of human rights or right holder victims, and that's the extractive sector that's been very public, uh, certainly over the last uh, 10 or 15 years. Right? So the context is, is, um, is, is fairly straightforward. Um, the extractive industries, of course, and uh, now flip to the next slide if, if you're following along. I'm not going to read this to you. There's, there's almost nothing worse than that. Uh, the extractive industries, of course, have been at the center of CSR and environmental responsibilities debate. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. The issue of CSR is itself horribly, horribly pregnant with contestations, with ambiguities, and with contradiction. When we talk about CSR, we are talking, you're going to see this as we go through, it's no longer possible to talk about this as a unitary concept. There are actually three streams that have been developing over the last five or six years. The traditional stream when you talk about CSR, one that has been regulated by the state forever, and by forever I mean a hundred years, who remembers past that? For Americans, that's like ancient. All right. the, the traditional stream is corporate philanthropy, good works, um, which has become an extraordinary driver of quote-unquote CSR, especially in East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, uh, to some extent India. But we're looking there, when you think CSR, you're thinking about philanthropy, quote-unquote good works, regulated through law, certainly in the United States and elsewhere through a combination of the tax law and the corporate law. That's a traditional marker for CSR and the CSR debates. Beyond that, the, the newest stream, is the sustainability stream uh, arising, well, not arising, but crystallized in the UN's sustainability goals. I think there's 17 of them. If you look at them, they have really nice graphics that help you remember what these things are. Sustainability includes everything from environmental uh, to systems to, um, to operational, to, to environmental protection, to the replenishment and the management of resources, including human resources, in the operation of economic activity. And then the third, which tends to be the most vocal 
in terms of the, the play it gets and the, the most well developed in terms of its theorization, although that's highly contested as well, um, is what is, is what we would all call the, the business and human rights sector of corporate social responsibility. And there uh, the driving forces have been uh, both corporate, internal corporate um, governance uh, movements since the 1990s, at least, 80s for some of them, but also driven conceptually by international organizations, mostly public international organizations, but some private international organizations as well. It remains highly contested. It's now crystallized around uh, two documents that I'm going to be talking about in some, in a little bit of detail, depending on how much time we have, which is the UN um, um, uh, guidelines uh, guiding, sorry, guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights and the OECD's Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. The two are close enough that it becomes a, a, a tongue, jum tongue jumble. I can't even speak anymore. All right, so this is the, the OECD and, and the UN. The UN much more driven by specific human rights. The, the language, the ideologies of human rights as has been developed through the UN structures, especially in Geneva over the last generation. The OECDs targeting that, but also targeting a broader reach, and specifically in areas that are of, of interest outside of, well, I was going to say outside of the West, and then I remember Siemens, um, uh, but much more interesting in areas like China, which is corruption, uh, transparency and evasion, those are brought into to this as well. So when you think about CSR, and you're going to see this, most people will move back and forth between the three, but they're really quite distinct. Philanthropy, sustainability, and uh, human rights. They're, it's the different talk, but just as a baseline, different sets of ideologies, different sets of premises, different sets of interactions between public and private bodies, and and the interactions among them are also increasingly com complex and contested. We're just going to play through them, but, but I just want to keep that going. And so, well, ultimately, in the extractive areas, in the context of CSR, however we're going to try to understand it, the issue has always been framed in terms of compliance. Right? There's a nice picture, that's a nice Australian lady. Uh, in, I did this the, the last time in Australia, so I had a picture of an Australian lady uh, who's involved, it looks like, in, in the extractive business. Right, and compliance really comes in two kinds, right? This is the trigger, the operating factor that gets us to our problem. You've got direct compliance and you've got indirect compliance, right? Direct compliance is simple. You've got to comply with law, certainly, pause, dot, 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 norms. Right, to the extent you operate in the societal sphere and it affects your bottom line, right, the business case for uh, adhering to market demands, consumer demands, lender demands, and the like. A lot of it is domestic law related, home and host states. This is direct compliance. But increasing amounts of soft law are now being hardened through corporate embrace. And so what winds up happening, it's hard to talk about there are a lot of caveats here. Sorry, I'm trying to condense a lot of stuff into a little bit of time. Uh, it's, it's almost now, I hate using the term soft law, uh, because it really refers to a, a 19th and early 20th century conception of law. Soft law is soft in the sense that it is not legislation that derives from a domestic legal order. Yet, when it is embraced within the internal governance of large enterprises, whose governance terrain includes global production chains, that internally is hardened. It's not soft law anymore. The language for its conversion is a language of contract. That's what you look at from the outside. The, the corporation is now governing either through contracts or through binding standards of some kind. Law, as in the relationship between the state and the objects of regulation, disappears. But it doesn't make it any less soft. So we talk about domestic law that is law that comes out from a public sovereign, soft law that is law that comes into an enterprise, an extractive enterprise in this case, by their own hand, right? And then we have private outside law and, and regulations and norms, and then we have indirect compliance, right? Who can force these businesses from the outside to change their habits, their rules, their governance, 
financial institutions, suppliers, and upstream customers tend to be the critical ones, and my focus is going to be on financial institutions. So uh, to work through this, what I'm going to do, the next picture, by the way, is, is interesting. For those of you who've never been there, that's Havana Harbor. And if you look at it carefully, if any of you have any environmental training, you should look at this picture with some horror, right? Because they're doing something that nowadays, when you're looking at sustainability, is the big no-no of environment, both environmental and sustainability directives, right? That you see there's smoke coming out and fire. This is a petroleum refinery. They're burning off natural gas. Right? If this were to occur in Britain right now, you'd have half a million protesters, the government would go into emergency session, and it would have broken all kinds of laws and norms. Uh, this picture was taken a year ago in Havana Harbor. They're still blowing this off, mostly because they don't have the technical capacity uh, to deal with it. But, but, so the focus of the discussion, which is why I put there for your amusement, but so the focus of the discussion is simple. So to what extent are financial institutions responsible for the human rights breaches of their borrowers. Not to the extent that they have the power to do it, but to what extent do outside legal or normative regimes either press or compel financial institutions to incur a responsibility. And notice I didn't say a legal obligation or responsibility, right, for the human rights breaches of their borrowers. And then the secondary question is how might these obligations constrain both the financial institutions and the borrower? So we're looking at the, the, the mechanics. So we're looking at the normative issues and then we're looking at the mechanics uh, for secondary responsibility in the context of loan making, uh, the way it may affect the pricing of capital, uh, in terms of covenant, the way it affects the relationships, the control relationships between a lender and borrowers, in this case in the extractive industry, and the due diligence obligations. Now you've got multiple, you've got a, a binary set of due diligence obligations that are now interlocking. The due diligence obligations that falls primarily to the operating company and the due diligence obligations towards of the financial um, institution that is grounded on compliance by the borrower with their own um, due diligence obligations. So it's a little complex. And again, this is why it's indirect. And that is the story that has become um, much more interesting and, 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 and has become more of an issue over the course of the last five or six years. So sorry for the long windup, but it just sort of gives you a, a sense of where we're going. So my roadmap is I'm, I'm going to start looking, which is the next picture, and it, it is a kind of curly Q circle. Um, I'm going to look at the international norm structures first. What is there in terms of good old fashioned law school? Good old fashioned law, right? That's what we like to hold on to. I'm then going to look at what's there that's not law, and then we're going to look at the application that is norm making through action. And then hopefully, if we have time, I'll look at a couple case studies, the OECD, uh, my two favorites, uh, sovereign wealth funds and uh, state-owned enterprises, and if we have time, uh, their interaction with uh, private standards. And that may be way more than that I've been, that I can chew, I think is the expression. Uh, but, but there you go. So let's look at direct compliance first. I wish I could have shown you this picture in color. If you look carefully, the picture sort of expresses where the next... 10 minutes or so is going to take you. It's, it's a Dutch 17th century picture of uh, a, a couple, four gentlemen in a drinking establishment without facilities. Um, you have to look at it carefully and think about that as, as we go through this. All right. Um, again, the, the before I start with this, here it's important again to bring front and center the, the caveat that I started out with, and that is the very different the, the, the very important difference between the discursive foundations of classical CSR within states and the discursive foundations of the business and human rights um, discussion, right? CSR, as we've traditionally um, talked about it, and you've got the materials, I'm not going to read it, but basically um, CSR arises out of a fundamental acceptance of the core Western notions about corporations, bodies corporate and corporate personality that takes as a given um, the rejection of stakeholder models uh, in, in, and the, the embrace of a shareholder or an enterprise wealth maximization model 
There are models that are grounded on the notion that the purposes of enterprises are to make money for their, quote unquote, their primary stakeholders, usually shareholders in the US, sometimes stakeholders, but fairly narrowly um, um, define sometimes the entity itself, that corporate purposes in society are broadly understood but narrowly constrained, um, and that generally all of this leads to philanthropy. And this is an issue, of course, that there's constant headbutting when we get into the, the business and human rights discourse, the traditional notions of corporations in law, in states. The business and human rights discourse, the, the, the notions of the obligations of corporations with respect to human rights, arises out of a very different discourse. While the discourse for CSR is domestic and economic, the discourse for human rights is public. It starts with the state and then migrates to the enterprise, to non-state actors, and it migrates there not willingly but unwillingly because discourse follows power and globalization has created a vast emptiness between the, the, rhetor the rhetorical authority of states and the reality of power diffusion within globalized uh, transactions with respect to which no one state has definitive legislative authority. Right? So you move, but the, the discourse you're moving is still and remains fundamentally public in its character and focused on obligation towards a subject population with respect to their dignity. I'm using the, the German term and, and quite, quite deliberately, the, the, the famous article, one of the, the German federal um, law. Uh, the German basic law is human dignity driven in the context of which other legal relationships, including those legal relationships that constitute non-state actors, are presumed to be dependent. Right? And so the presumption always within the business and human rights community, at least at a certain level, and, and I'm essentializing and generalizing and there's all kinds of eddies and caveats and whatever and we can talk about that. Uh, is that in fact what you have is a global discourse founded on the supremacy of international law once the realm solely of states but now applied directly or indirectly to non-state actors with governmental authority uh, but in the in character very different very similar to that um, that applied to the state so very very different notion the idea of of the protection for example of corporate autonomy of asset partitioning, the, uh, the protection of, of um, shareholder interest within the international discourse is just is viewed as insanely incomprehensible because you, you never get there because of the overriding primacy of the notions of human dignity bound up in uh, the, the two international covenants, the International Bill of Human Rights and, and the like. So you're looking at two very discursive things. So I, I needed that caveat, I keep saying it over and over. So it's in that context that we can look at the international norm structures. Just very briefly, this is the, uh, the one with the pretty map, just gives you an outline of where we're going. And I put in the pretty map because by now you're probably going, oh my god, I need visual stimulus of some kind. Right, so we're looking at hard law versus soft law, domestic versus international, public versus private. They're binaries. These are stacked binaries that, that make this area fairly interesting. Right, hard versus soft, domestic versus international, public versus private. All right, and also binaries in the context of operation disclosure versus substantive structures, and then linkages between social norms, markets, international law, and national law, which is what we're going to be looking at. So hard law, this is the only easy part of this whole thing. Hard law, international hard law with respect to the, uh, the human rights obligations, for example, of extractives, the answer is there's nothing. Finally, we get to an area where we can definitively say there's nothing. Ah, but wait, there's the new Comprehensive Business and Human Rights Treaty, assuming it goes forward. The next meeting, the third meeting of the uh, Intergovernmental Working Group is coming up in a week or so. Uh, we'll see where they go. It's been a reality TV show drama, <laughs> as everyone with any kind of interest in styling themselves a, uh, on the, the great theater of international norm making wants a part. It's like a Shakespearean play where all of the mob now gets there. But, sorry, I'm being judgmental on that stuff. That's, that's bad. But anyway, so there it is. It, it may come, it may not. 
but in terms of international law, hard law, there's none. Yeah, they're joint hybrid efforts, but mostly in the context of corruption and bribery. Um, their investment treaties, we're going to talk about that. There's interesting developments, especially out of your country, or the country in which you're all sitting. I, that presumes too much. Um, the country in which you're sitting, um, some efforts to actually expand, to move the traditional domestic discourse, legal discourse, in a more internationalized and human rights sensitive way. Um, and I've noted a couple of the of English cases coming down, the, and they apply in two contexts. One is the expansion of the fiduciary duty of care rule uh, to apply across enterprises and to tag a, a board of directors, usually of an apex company, for knowing and preventing or mitigating downstream um, uh, activities which may result in liability or breach, depending on what the, the court's proclivities are. And then the other one is, is a natural um, cousin to that, and that's expanding veil piercing, right? The whole problem that the international human rights community has with business and human rights is that business and human rights takes the notion of corporate autonomy seriously, and you all were the pioneers in establishing um, corporate autonomy in cases at the end of the, of the last century, or the beginning of the last century. Sorry. And so to undo it is to take veil piercing and to transform it from an equitable exception to a legal rule into this engine for developing standards for disregarding it almost at will, and effectively to use veil piercing as a, as a the common law of enterprise liability or enterprise organization across uh, otherwise autonomous entities. We don't know where it's going. Right now it's very new. The Americans are trying this too. I got 30 minutes. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll do this one way or another. Right. And then national laws, which is what everyone is focusing on. So that's judicial uh, national laws. This is the context, right, in which the extractives and everyone else is now focused. So we're looking at the borrower, by the way, in, in this context. This is what the borrower is facing. We haven't gotten to the financial um, entities yet. The borrower, when they're looking, we're looking at international law, joint hybrid efforts, judicial law. National law tends to have gotten the spotlight over the last several years. You've got Dodd, Frank, and most of these are disclosure-oriented, and some of them have extraterritorial application, which sometimes makes people crazy. Uh, that's an issue that, um, for which there's no consensus. Um, I, I pointed out three of them, and one that's coming up, the Dodd-Frank Act on Conflict Minerals, the Your Modern Slavery Act which may or may not be a big deal. Uh, it's certainly a big media event. Uh, but you've got your Modern Slavery Act. We've got a version in states. We've got the, the California Act, uh, which is sort of kind of like it, but not quite. Uh, France has the supply chain due diligence law. And what they're pushing now in Australia, their hearings that are going on, is a high, it's, it's a second generation modern slavery bill, which includes some of the supply chain due diligence aspects of the French law. Um, with the, um, the disclosure obligations in the UK Act. And that may be the, the next thing that's coming up. We're, we're following this. Who knows what will happen uh, with that. Uh, the next slide actually shows you some more CSR reporting. Again, most of the national stuff requires some disclosure, and most of the disclosure is narrative. So we pay people like me or people like your students a lot of money in law firms to write these narratives that meet um, the, as long as you meet the anti-fraud provisions and you comply literally with the law, um, you may incur some litigation, but you won't incur liability. It's mostly reporting. The thing that everyone hates, from the international uh, NGO community to the, um, to the business community, is a notion that may actually come to pass, and that is the quantification of these obligations and their embedding into financial statements, which is where the rubber would hit the road. We're nowhere near that stage. Uh, no one's yet interested in doing it. It's a monumental project, but it's likely coming before I die. Hopefully I won't die for a while because it's going to take a while um, to do, but that's what we got. All right, beyond that we have a bunch of soft law because we really are in the realm of soft law. So when you're looking at hard law, you're looking at some judicial uh, issues some from crazy English and U.S. courts, mostly. You've got some hard law, mostly disclosure, and it really is relatively easy 
even in the French context, I think there'll be some hiccups. It'll be relatively easy to comply. Just have your high price lawyers produce the, the paper that's required to sacrifice it. The rubber really hits the road with soft law, right? And we've got, um, I'll just quickly go through them, the UN guiding principles, the guidelines for multinationals, bilateral investment treaties, third party standards, uh, the internal norms of enterprises, and uh, the social license for extractives. Right, again, it will take me six months to go through this just very briefly. So what are these? The UN guiding principles, three-part structure, a state duty to protect human rights, a corporate responsibility to respect human rights, and remedial obligations for both. The, the state duty is particularly applicable, right? It's a, but it's, it's a weird duty, right? So it's a state duty to protect human rights as and to the extent a state under international law has bound itself legally to those instruments of international law to which it wants to be bound, which is great. If you're China, that means that you have utterly rejected the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights. That doesn't exist. And you have no duty to protect those rights. If you're the Americans, you've rejected the International Covenant for Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. You have absolutely no obligation, no duty to protect those rights. Right? And the two are never going to meet. Other states have, have done them both. So it's, it's a very weird duty. It's a duty that's mandatory, but it's undercut by traditional notions of international law. That say, eh, unless you can prove it's Jeff Kogan's, and of course for international lawyers, it's always, right, it, it's always international customary law or, or Jeff Kogan's. There's some reason that it ought to be applied in, in for most states, like the Americans and the Chinese, they say that's very nice. Thank you, Mr. Academic, but no. Uh, or as one of our justices once said, where are your troops? Um, knock yourself out, it's not going to happen, right? So, but it does apply, especially to SOEs. It applies to development banks. It applies to sovereign wealth funds. Very contentious here, uh, especially in Norway, um, where the, the <laughs> quite public and embarrassing um, fight between the Norwegian National Contact Point and the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund found that the Sovereign Wealth Fund itself was violating key human rights provisions within its own human rights approach with the, which they had mandated uh, and put on themselves. And of course you've got the IFIs, International Financial Institutions. The corp now notice it's a state duty to protect, but it's a corporate responsibility to respect. This falls out of the legal framework and structures of the state duty. It's in the societal realm. And what it does is require corporations to act responsibly in the context of their social duty, in the sum of their interactions with all of their stakeholders. And the method for doing that is what they call human rights due diligence, which is a series of about 10 principles within it. That requires the usual. You're going to uh, create a, corpor a corporate culture. You're going to identify those areas that, are, that may uh, affect the human rights holders within the ambit of your economic activity. You're going to monitor. You're going to identify. You're going to mitigate. You're going to compensate where you can't mitigate. And then you're going to disclose. Right? That's the notion. And ultimately, it's supposed to be effective, but non-legal. It's societal. And that was a huge, huge thing, but I, I, we won't go there. And of course, there's remedies. The, the UNGP uh, focuses on the primacy of state remedial notions, judicial and non-judicial, and then um, corporate grievance procedures. So all corporations, and this is particularly important in the extractive areas, corporations are supposed to have uh, frontline grievance mechanisms for resolving problems, unless, of course, the, um, the international community doesn't like what happens, and that became an issue, for example, in the Barrick case. Um, but there it is. The OECD guidelines adds, it's not human rights oriented. Again, it's more sustainability and, and uh, governance oriented. There are 11 areas, uh, and I've put them there. The, the ones I highlight for you are transparency, bribery, corruption. Uh, what they did do was after the, um, the um, uh, guiding principles were brought in, they incorporated the guiding principles in new chapter four of the OECD. And the thing that makes this cool is that unlike the guiding principles, the OECD guidelines has a quasi enforcement. form for them to revisit that. <laughs>
So what, that was kind of tactful, wasn't it? Uh, so what might one do? Um, in this case, what one might do is cut a deal with the banks that control the financing of palm oil because you can't do palm oil finance, you can't do palm oil fine farming without finance. Right, this is agricultural businesses, just they need the money, it was for cash flow. And so what they did was this thing, they, they got, there was a, um, an NCP uh, special instance filed by Friends of the Earth uh, in the Dutch NCP and they cut a deal. And what the deal was with the Dutch government that in fact Rabobank now has undertaken to include as part of its due diligence and as part of its loan the, um, the round table for responsible palm oil principles, right, in managing their, their uh, banking. Now, of course, there's a lot of weasel words in the agreement. Sorry, that sounds so judgmental. There are a lot of ambiguities, waivers, and outs that might be useful in, uh, in individual cases. But effectively, what Rabobank now does is they have legalized, governmentalized the, uh, the Roundtable for Responsible Palm Oil. They have vested Rabobank with the duty to incorporate it into its lending practices from its due diligence to its monitoring of its loan, right? And in the process, of course, what have you done? You've now hardwired and incorporated the, um, the Responsible Palm Oil into the operations of at least 70% of the sector. Right now, extrapolate that and think about other sectors that are all reliant on, um, on, on the on financing. The idea here is: look, what we can do is, if we can't do this directly by legislation, we can do this by cutting a deal with banks, getting banks to agree to certain things. Right, especially to the government, not governmentalization, the governance. There's got to be a word for this. Um, in their contract, and then you guys monitor, right? The state no longer is monitoring this in the first instance, the state is monitoring the bank. To some extent, the state is monitoring palm oil as well, but that's not in Indonesia. But now the Netherlands has their hand around the throat of someone they can control. They can control Rabobank, even if they can't control the sector, which is of interest to them. And so you've got a very, very interesting now a change in legal relationships, a change in governance that, that might be kind of, depending on where it goes, that might be kind of interesting in terms of the relationship of the state, law, governance, public, and private enterprises. Where it goes, I don't know. It may all be a big laugh at the end of the day. Ah, ha, ha, it's a great experiment, but the sovereign majesty of law and the state will win out and, you know, thanks for the entertainment. Or it may be something new we don't know yet. Um, the, the, the second one I was going to talk about is uh, the use of sovereign wealth funds. And Norway is, is kind of the, 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 the poster child for this. So what goes on in Norway? Norway's got one of the biggest sovereign wealth funds on earth. They invest. There's not a, a public company in, in Britain, I don't think, in which the sovereign wealth fund hasn't taken a position. Um, they have a lot of money, they invest, and they also, now sovereign wealth funds are doing joint ventures, they're, they're doing the work of development banks, they're doing all kinds of things. They're, they're a pot of money with no place to go, and so they're going everywhere, right? Which is okay and, and of no interest to us, except that in the case of Norway, they say we're going to do, as a legal requirement imposed on us by the state, we have to include in our management of the fund what they call ethical obligations. And the ethical obligations effectively require them to transpose international human rights and sustainability norms into their investment strategies and then to apply them in two respects. One is in the decisions to invest or not invest, that is to keep uh, a company within or outside of their investment universe, and there are a number of categories, for example, in which they won't invest. Um, Landmines, nuclear stuff, uh, and now coal, which is the latest one they've been divesting. The more interesting one is that the, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, and now especially over the last two years, uh, that the Norges Bank has taken much more active control over their investing rather than the Ethics Council as they say, well, okay, look, we've got a structure where we've got ethical guidelines, we've got an Ethics Council, it, uh, which is the group that is vested with 
the right to look at the compliance by companies in a, in a kind of serendipitous way. We'll look at some, we can't look at all of them because there are only five of us. Right. But we're going to look at them and determine whether they're complying with our ethical norms or not. And the ethical norms includes everything from gross human rights violations uh, to corruption to uh, gross environmental uh, destruction to uh, a number of categorical things. And if you do not comply with our ethical obligation, then we will make a recommendation to the Norges Bank, it used to be the finance ministry, that you be excluded from the fund. About three years ago, what became much more uh, important was that you could, instead of excluding them, it's a, a, you know, a one-zero proposition, you can put them under observation. And if you put them under observation, the company was willing to be put under observation, they would then effectively um, agree to a course of reform and reporting that once it satisfied the Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, the Sovereign Wealth Fund would take them off the observation list. Siemens was one of the first. Uh, with their, you all remember the corruption, there was corruption everywhere, including Europe's like four or five billion. Uh, 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 the latest one is Petrobras. Uh, when the Chinese come, they just kick them out of the investment universe, and that's an issue, but that's a, a, that's a, uh, a Norwegian pension fund issue. That's, that's a subject for another day, but you can do that. And in the process, of course, what winds up happening, there's a substantial oversight in the day-to-day -day activities within this provision by the fund. They can do one other thing, and that is they have now more aggressively begun to exercise their shareholder power, their power as an institutional shareholder, to seek to embed the international, the Norwegianized international norms that are expressed through, but not only in the ethics principle, in the governance of the companies in which they have investment. And then they go, they go on these there are, uh, there are categories that they tend to emphasize from time to time. Recently it was um, the pay for executives. Uh, sometimes it's corruption, sometimes it's something else, but they're looking at everything. And so here you have a, a case where you've got a sovereign financing body that is using both their ability to control access to markets, because if they're out of the, you go, oh, who cares? Right, so Norway doesn't invest in me, but Norway does this very noisily. It can have a cascade effect you're not locked out of the markets, but what it does is it may affect the pricing of your loans. There's uh, there's some empirical studies out, and of course with these empirical studies, there may be a relationship, there may not, it may be too close to call, no one knows yet, but it's possible. Right, but beyond that, right, their ability now to inject themselves into the governance of these enterprises that mimics the second order, the indirect ability of finance enterprises like banks and others to also control the internal operations of companies. So all of a sudden, and they've excluded a bunch of companies, and, um, and I'm not going to go through them, there's a bunch of, of things here. Last one, how many seconds do I have left? <laughs> like two seconds. Just very quickly on banks, um, at the end of this I've got a bunch of information. Banks have begun doing what the sovereign wealth funds are doing, I just note for example, my favorite, if you if you want to cut to the chase, is HSBC, which I think operates around here too. So I'm trying to find a bank that that y'all can relate to, right? And what they do is they have already embedded into their hard law the the legislative universe, the constitutional universe of their own lending practices, uh, especially in the context. For example, I pu I pulled their minings and metals policy out. Already, they can tell you there there are some minings and metals. Um, work that they won't do. Uh, they will incorporate a number of standards, right? So, for example, they, they won't operate, they, they won't lend to UNESCO World Heritage, Heritage Sites so if, if you want to extract under Petra, um, it becomes harder. On the other hand, that may be disguised language for, it's not that we won't lend, but it'll cost you more. Uh, it's not clear, we don't have enough data yet to figure out which of the two it is, artisanal mining, blah, blah, blah. But, so, they haven't said, we're not going to you're, in a sense, excluded from our lending universe. But if you are included in our lending universe, then you've got a bunch of standards that uh, HSBC will apply. The International Cyanide Management Code, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, the European Union Emissions Trading Schemes, the International Finance 
uh, corporation trading scheme. So they embed this stuff already in their loans, and it's becoming uh, a fairly common thing in some of the more high profile, where they've gotten bad press kind of areas. <clears throat> so credit agricole is another one that, that has a bunch. So now I've, I've, I've finished. So what I've tried to present, and I apologize for a long, wordy, and fairly complicated route, is that something that was simple and completely irrelevant maybe a generation ago. Who cares about corporate social responsibility or sustainability or human rights? Who cares? It's this hortatory thing. We'll donate a couple of money, a couple of dollars to Sister Mary Ann's orphanage, and we're done, right? That world view and its legality has now morphed into something far more complex, not in law in states, but has now metastasized into a not even close to being done project, which involves potentially radical transformations in the nature of relationships within production chains between actors in them, between states and international organizations, and between public and private. So something simple like I'll donate some money to Sister Mary's uh, orphanage now becomes embedded in codes that are not binding legally, but maybe compelling societally that build a set of contractual relations that migrate lawmaking from the state to the enterprise that reifies the production chain as a territory, as a legislative territory with new methods of legalities and that reorders the legal and normative relationships between transnational private actors, international organizations, uh, and the state. Is this all, does this all have long-term traction? I don't know. Is it going to look the same way five years from now? Probably not. Are there people who look at the story I've just woven with horror, saying, no, 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 this is all just BS and the majesty of law will come back and it's just a matter of getting uh, decent people in government? Um, now that may be true, or <clears throat> will this open the door to even more radical transformations? I don't know, but it's all there. And, um, and enterprises with vast amounts of money and substantial interest in this have already been moving and making facts in a number of different directions. Thank you so much for your patience in, in keeping this. <laughs>
And I just wonder whether you, I mean, I, I, please don't misunderstand me, I, I like the paper very much, but I think you criticise antinomies or dichotomies in your paper, or you say these are classical dichotomies and we've got to think beyond them. Whereas I actually think that you reinforce them, because we could just look at this as, a, as a, something like a, a global densification of really relatively classical principles of public law. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and, and, and that's that on that, that in fact would have been the question I would have asked myself. Mm -hmm. And then I would have paused and said, oh my God, you've got a point. And, and indeed, they're, they're parallel. There's no single way of looking at phenomena. And, and in a sense, what, I, what I've done is I've started, it's, it's what I've called the, the fool's journey through a, a set of facts. Right? And what I see is all of the, the arrangements Right? and the relationships that are now arising. And I'm thinking, well, there are probably a number of ways in which we can look at what is a, a set of emerging or changing or mutating um, relationships. And yeah, one way of looking at it is saying, aha, there's, in a sense, there's, and, and I do like um, global constitutionalist theory. I've flirted with it um, occasionally, and there are some really, really important points to it. I'm going to criticize it in a second, but, but not criticize it in a sense, show my anxiety about it a little bit. But it, and, and here it is, that in a sense it gets its power um, from what I view as potentially its weakest point, which is its adherence to a fundamental premise that nothing changes and that what we're doing is that the foundational interactions remain the same. The question is the redrawing of the boxes within which they occur. The, I mean, yeah, no, and, and we ought to, to argue about this. It's, it's possible to reject this, but in a sense what you're saying, oh, look, there's nothing new under the sun. This really is just taking patterns and taking relationships that are already well established and well worn and then place, replacing them in more relevant context. There'll be some modifications, there'll be some issues that we can deal with, but are we really dealing with the same notion? There's, uh, you know, there's corporate constitutionalism is a, the corporation in, in itself. I could have gone that way and, and suggested, for example, that Apple itself is now the, the internally and over its mm. terrain, right, its, its production chain, is the new state. And the same sorts of issues of legitimacy, mm. of lawmaking, of uh, accountability, sure. uh, of relationships are all applying. We may be using different sure. words, but... No, I don't have any problem with that. It's just why we need to then, why don't we look at, this is precisely why we might need to turn the paradigm around and say, actually we're looking at a transformation or an adaptation of public law rather than approaching this to private law. If what you're saying yeah. essentially is that corporations, in, they, they have actually become functional equivalents to states in certain respects, then this raises a public law question, either domestic public law or... Okay, right, 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 and, and okay. And I've tried not to walk all the way there because sure. I'm, I'm and, and the reason is because I'm not sure that while to some extent they have assumed some of the functions of classical states, I don't think that they, they are either becoming or aspire to or going to ultimately be forced to assume the roles of the classical state. Mm -hmm. Indeed, my, my view is, is, is actually different, and, and your question is actually useful to help me sort all of this out. It's sort of two questions that kind of moved from yeah. one to the other. But anyway, thank you very much. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Right. And, and so the, the, the real answer is, what I'm seeing is not a, a replication or modification mm -hmm. of public law in, in a quote-unquote private law context. In, in, in the, the, but rather a fracture of power relationships so that what used to be viewed as a whole, right, the constitutional notion of the state uh, within its territory and its monopoly authority and it, it, the, the workings in, yeah. No, as well as I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, the, with the caveats, but, but at least the idealized model, that that model is now fractured and that the system that arises, you can't recreate it. You can recreate bits and pieces of it in places but you're not going to be able to put that egg together. And global constitutionalism 
I think helps us understand some of the interactional dynamics and a lot of the premises, and there is a lot of public law that's then moving into, you can't avoid it, right, into the governmentalized spaces of private actors. But I don't think what you're seeing is the, the succession of, of the attributes of a state in private actors, but I may be, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really on a limb because I may be completely wrong. Uh, in this, and I'm hoping I'm wrong because there's a bit of comfort. The the thing I like about um, uh, global constitutionalist theory is that it actually gives us a nice, stable framework within which to look at some of the 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 changes. But I'm I'm sort of. I think you're a global constitutionalist. Say what? I think you're a global constitutionalist. No, no, <laughs> name calling, name calling. It's fun. No, and, and it is possible. It's possible. I mean, and, and honestly, for me, I, I really am just looking at this now um, at, at a very early stage. And it may be possible at the end of the day, I'm going to go, oh my God, I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. Ah, I've got to go home. The prodigal son returns. Um, or it may be that I'll send you a postcard from Harvard as I wind up. But yeah, no. But the point is well. The point is well taken. Thank you. We have two, oh, three questions. We have uh, Professor Despermo. We'll just walk around the table. If that, if that's okay, we'll walk, and we have our colleague okay. here, and then we'll. Come and maybe we can take several questions at a time. Would you like to do? Could we throw a few your, questions? Your choice. Your choice. Your choice. Oh, God. Yeah, I mean a very, very quick elementary methodological and epistemological question. So now I'm not <laughs> very quick. I think it's, it's a question I raise all the time, so uh, people in the room uh, have heard it. So the, you've conducted extensive research, and this is very impre impressive. But you have conducted this research under the banner of a very specific uh, idea of, of, of legality. And that idea of legality allows you to make claims that this is an issue of lawmaking, that lawmaking has migrated from the state to... To, to companies, to, uh, to multinational companies, that we are witnessing new methods of creating legality, I quote, unquote. Yeah. Well, this is, these are findings that are possible by virtue of your understanding of, 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 of legality. You, 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 you could make the exact same finding, or at least you could conduct the very same research and, and shed light on the very same phenomena without calling this law. You could <laughs> say this is an issue of standard setting, and these standards happen to be uh, relied on by domestic court. Uh, and these settings may be enforced by virtue of some legal mechanism, but at the end of the day, they are just standards. At least that would be a more European take on the matter. Uh, Except in Germany. Except where they, where they just Germany is an island, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but so the question is, what do you gain by studying this under the banner of, of law? I mean, couldn't you just make the same argument saying these are just international standards which have an impact? Uh, they do inform the behavior of, of, of all these actors. And of, so, what, what, what it's, so that's the epistemological yeah, dimension yeah, yeah. of the question. What do you gain? Is that because you think that this has better descriptive virtues, to call it law, soft law, whatever it is? Do you think it's because, because you think lawyers have more legitimacy to study these phenomena? Do you think that law schools should have a monopoly on these studies and not other laws, other schools? I got a joint so. appointment, so I, <laughs> I hedge my bets. <laughs> no, 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 I, your, your point is well taken. And let me just walk around with the other questions. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Sure, yeah. Um, I wanted to pick up on the global constitutionalism point, and I guess I have some sympathy with John's, uh, John's take on that, which is, uh, you know, the other way to think of, of this is changes in the the contours and the nature and workings of power rather than um, a change in the nature of law or constitutions or, or governance. And it seems to me that the big issue uh, th at stake in that is the question of accountability uh, in that the corporations don't, uh, you know, are, are very different entities in that regard. As you were speaking, I wondered you know, in deputizing, do you also authorize? And and what is the what is the flip side of the responsibilities that they take on? Um, the other uh, point, if you don't mind, that I just want to raise, as you were speaking, I was thinking of the Financial Action Task Force, the anti-money laundering mm -hmm. regimes that go on around the world. 
and the ways in which soft law in that regard is transformed into uh, national national ventures. And I was I was just thinking about what the the, the potential for capture in a venture like that, and the and the the motivations that can go into that. In the anti money laundering scheme, it seems that there's a there's a kind of financial arbitrage motivation that lay behind it. In that uh, some countries that were trying to combat money laundering didn't want to be the only ones, and they wanted to assure that this kind of practice circulated. And it seems to me that you can make a comparable argument about rights arbitrage, that countries that do pursue human, a human rights agenda don't want to be saddled with an unequal cost of, of doing so, and so want to, to uh, globalize or universalize that, that venture. Uh, and I just wondered what you, whether you thought there was anything to that argument. The short answer is absolutely, my God, yes. But, sorry, oh, absolutely. And, and as you were talking, I was thinking about the financial uh, stability, the, what's it called, the Financial Stability Standards Board, the, um, that thing that was, that creature of the G20, mm -hmm. Financial Stability Board. FSC, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, which has also done exactly the same thing and I just did a paper looking at the way in which uh, the DOJ has been taking their litigation guidelines and effectively turning them into mandatory corporate compliance in return for which they won't get indicted. In the <laughs> uh, and then, and, but the globalization point is absolutely right, and that's the the FSB is that you develop a center, and it's the OECD model too. You, you develop that standard, and then, as one of the FSB reports said, you cram it down your, um, your what did they call it, not your influence chain. They had some soft name, but essentially the people that, the states that you can really control, and you just cram it down, and then globalize it. But you adopt it first. It's the, it's the standard at the elite tier, and then cram down. But yeah, no, I guess. <laughs> 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 Sorry, you, you animated me first. <laughs> There's two more questions to throw on the table. And I still got to answer there, the other three more, and then we're going to uh, let Larry have the final word no. and respond. Right. Um, a very kind of practical comment and, and, uh, and, and a question. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I think, uh, for me personally, it comes at a very, very crucial uh, time. Um, I, I run a human rights organization that works on Syria. And the issue of reconstruction and business coming in and every country is calling on, on other countries, Russia is calling upon Japan, the EU just put in its policy that they want to reconstruct if there's a political process and all the companies wanting to, uh, to, to jump in. So we're actually in the middle of, of a grant proposal negotiation with a donor building an entire business and human rights unit within the organization that monitors these, these matters and this was very fascinating. And I'm speaking tomorrow in Brussels on that, uh, on, on the issue of, of reconstruction. And finally, uh, I'm also working with the, with the Office of Higher Commissioner on population transfer, the ha a, a forced population transfer that happened in Syria. Uh, and given that in a lot of these areas, such as Aleppo, where it happened, UNHCR is issuing tenders for companies to come in and do rubble removal for areas that were destroyed. And that raises a lot of, um, a, a lot of questions that, which made us wanting to look into the whole business and human rights uh, issues. Now, when we looked at some of the in instruments that you mentioned, We've seen them more tailored towards, you know, kind of child labor, labor rights, but not kind of the next level uh, human rights abuses of, of war crimes or knowing who to work with and not financing um, crimes and these, and, and these uh, matters. Okay. And, and we've seen them only stuck to situations of kind of uh, issues that would come up in developing countries or after a long period of post-conflict, but not of the, after the immediate post-conflict or, uh, or in the case of Syria, the ongoing uh, conflict right. or the case of Iraq or the case of Libya or the case of uh, um, or the case of Yemen. So do, do you see that there's room for, like uh, or, or do you see the, these standards as sufficient when it comes to these kind of thematical uh, kind of practical considerations that, that we're facing? I mean the only case that we've seen was the French company Lavarge which worked uh, which was a cement company and ha and the CEO had to resign because it worked in ISIS controlled territory. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. But they okay. they've they've cited financing terrorism and war crimes rather than saying you know this is our business and human rights matter. It was matter matter that was taken to court in in uh, in, in, in fact. 
There's another case in Germany against a company that sold intelligence equipment to the government, to the Syrian government. There's some, some, some of these cases which are actually turning into, into hard law, but it, it ha has the guiding principles and all the documents that you mentioned. Do you see them fit for purpose to look into the more serious kind of human rights uh, issues that are relevant to the situations that, that I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah. We have two colleagues over here to throw into the hats in the ring. Well, just thank you for the presentation. Um, mine is a question about, you mentioned... So, obviously we're talking about international finance organization. Um, how ethical is to have um, an international financial institution to legalize the relationship with the borrowers, um, considering in the framework where they've been working in the last uh, decades or so, um, what would be the consequences um, of this kind of internal uh, activity and who would be responsible to check on, on this uh, private no state relationship. So that's one my question about ethical. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks again also for the paper. And I, I was I was wondering of some of the comments that you've made. And you mentioned China, I think in passing several times. And I think I, I took it as China being the 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 one who might not be bothered as to. You are not going to land because of financial ethical criteria. Well, we might be able to help you out, and we are going to ignore this. Or if it's not China, there might be somebody else. So if we're talking um, from from the economic perspective of actors, if you have actors who are happy to provide the same service for a lesser price in various circumstances and bypassing the direct control of the multi of the head of the multinational corporation and we've seen it happen in Bangladesh for instance <laughs> that we had yeah. we had down the line we had uh, providers who actually were not bothered were providing for lesser cost so is that just a flare in that sense that eco some economic realities are going to yeah. undermine this effort Excellent. Of course, I have a definitive answer for <laughs> not even close. <laughs> All right. Um, the question about legality. Absolutely. But I, I have to make a confession. Uh, most of my academic career has been uh, to situate me in the role of Puck, um, which, is, which is sort of my, my preferred default voice in, in uh, looking at a lot of questions. Um, I tend to view things ironically and I really love sending up the uh, pretensions of the objects sometimes of, of my... So you have to look at this from, from my own... And, and it is a failing of mine for which I beg your forgiveness, um, accept your contempt, um, but it has been fun. Um, being being puck and and I'm sort of puckish about uh, in a good way uh, about the the notion of legality. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. We can look at this and and indeed, I'm beginning to think that the notion of legality is a large multi-century joke on us uh, because and I'm being recorded. This is actually very foolish. And that, but, um, in a sense, the notion of legality. Um, is is tied to um, <laughs> is is tied both to the notion of the of the state in a particular way, and to a, a set of norms. And in a, in when I look at things in this way, I'm actually accepting uh, and and in a setup mode the ideal of legality as a notion, and then just sending it up. Um, this is the sword you have used, right? And this is how we've built institutions. This is the ideology that we have built. Whatever we, openings there may be otherwise, we always retreat back to law and legality. Um, and we do it in variations. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on the Marxist-Leninist variation of law, rule of law, and legality.
um, which is somewhat distinct from, but has some connections with the legality that we have developed in Western liberal democracies um, in its most extreme form, which is my favorite target, which is the German model, right outside of the, the state and outside. This, the state can only speak in one voice, and the voice through which the state speaks authoritatively is uh, using the language of law, and beyond that, there are morals and ethics which may or may not bind, but it is of no interest to us, and we can, at our will, either subsume them or, or get rid of them. That's a model that we, we can steer away from. Um, and, but we, 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 we return to it because of the inherent connection, at least in my mind, and I'm probably wrong, so please forgive me, uh, the inherent ideological connection between legality, the state, and the primacy of the language of politics. To move to standards, right, and, and that brings up, and, and you're absolutely right, the, you know, why do we do it, legitimacy, authority, ideology, blah, blah, blah. But really, to look at it, one without even thinking about it, also accepts the primacy of politics, right, which is an express through law. As we move into a world that is driven through globalization, through economic relationships, we're beginning to see a shift from a primacy of the language of politics and its ideology, its consequential ideology, to the language of economics. Not Marxist-Leninist style, because European Marxist-Leninists were as tied to these notions of politics and, and law in their own way, despite all their blatherings, at least in Europe. Um, different in China, but um, when we move to the language of economics, right, now all of a sudden the language of, of the consequences of the use of the language of politics, which is the embedding the primacy of law and legality, right, then shifts. And now it becomes much easier to say, ah, you know, we don't really care. Law, standards, norms, governance, and it's all the same. We move from a formal conception, right, to a functional conception, and a functional conception grounded in objectives. What objectives? The transactional objectives that economic, the ideology of economics and its discourse then gives us. So, in a sense, yeah, you're right. But part of it is this: there's this or change in the discourse that's also messing with our ability. To, to deal with conceptualizations, and that's the, the change in the, the fundamental, the, the foundations of our discourse, I think, from politics to economics, and which has been brought on by globalization and by the, sh the shift in authority. And that's a guess, and, and so that, that's as good as I got for you. Um, beyond the guess, I love the financial action task force, and you're absolutely right, part. Um, the, the uh, changes in the, the contours of, of working parties, the big issue is accountability, and absolutely, the big issue is accountability. But again, the question is, what do we mean by accountability, right, and to whom? At this point, I start thinking, oh, accountability, cool. We don't need legality at all. And in fact, we don't even need normative structures anymore very much. I'm going back to Shanghai, we're talking about big data management and social credit. We're talking about the management. You want to hold someone accountable? You want to hold a law school accountable? Rank them. Mm -hmm. And then control the parameters with respect to which they're ranked. You want to hold a consumer accountable? Start rank. You don't use pricing anymore in a sense. Mm -hmm. Start ranking their credit, <coughs> right? You control their, their consumer. The Chinese have already begun now to think through this, not just in the usual terms, credit and behavior, but for example, in revising the way in which they can use data and algorithms to predict the outcomes of a litigation by reference to, they've got a data set now, I think of two or three million cases that they're trying to work through, crunch through, so that the predictive capacity of this, which is then used to hold judges accountable for correct decisions. So, yes, accountability is a... Sorry. I, I, I take your point, and I should have spoken more carefully. I should have said democratic accountability. Ah, <laughs> ah, my God, that word makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Does. it? Ah. But yeah, and no, I, yeah, I'm with you.
I'm with you. One of the, the one of the difficulties of this whole business, and and I've railed about this in the context of of, uh, for example, remedies for uh, human rights wrongs, uh, where NGOs, sorry, where NGOs become representatives. The one of the for all of its weirdnesses, one of the values of the state is that you have a fairly easy to understand set of of obligations and and rights that produces a fairly easy to understand accountability structure grounded in mass democratic principles. And we like it. And there is very little in the world that kind of suggests that there may be something better. So maybe numbers, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully I'll be dead by the time that regime comes in. But how do you transpose it, right? Now we've got, you're right, we've got an issue of global constitutionalism. Now we're going to transpose some core accountability, not accountability, legitimacy um, and structural um, stability issues out from its old home into this wilderness, right? How do you do that without losing its essential value? And the answer is, wow, I don't know. And indeed, that's where um, there's some difficulty, even in the context in which we haven't even been able to get the entire community of nations to even buy into a fairly uniform notion of democratic accountability at all. Chinese Marxist-Leninists, Iranian theocrats, Western European liberal demo uh, democracy, Cuban Euro uh, Marxism, right, have, will hear the word democratic accountability and will think quite different things, grounded in quite different perceptions of the meanings of those words. So we can't even get the, our houses in order back when we worshiped at the, the altar of the state system. When that fractures, then the, the problem gets compounded and my heart sinks. But we have an easier time with democratic deficit. No, oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's alliteration. It's much. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we kind of see it when we see it, although even there there's contention. Of course. Right, right, right. But n now you've got not a democratic deficit, you've got a Grand Canyon, <laughs> right, of, of deficit, and we don't have the structures really to deal with it. We've got global constitutionalism, which helps, but the ultimate transformation to systems whose operation we're really not clear about yet makes it. it it's, it's a challenge. Right. That, again, that's as good as I got for now, and it's probably not good. The global civil society thing, yeah, you're right. You have to look at uh, uh, UNGP 7 and 21, I think it is. The issue here, and, and it, the UNGPs were made murky for a reason. There's a lot of negotiation in the, in the language. The idea was by its drafters that this is a language that was supposed to endure, and so you wanted it as... Um, as oracular as the American Constitution, so you can infuse it with whatever you want over the course of a long period of time. Um, here, the, for you, the issue is complicity. That would be the standard. There's some stuff out there. There's complicity language, I think, in 7 and 21. Uh, the OECD has also put out a, a toolkit for weak governance zones, and there's a discussion about weak governance zones. And so here, the context is Syria has a weak governance or no governance, depending on your, your politics, right? In that context, the obligations of private actors is heightened, and the rules that they have to, and, and this starts by the initial question is, what rule do you apply? Do you apply the rules of Syria antebellum? Do you apply the current rules in the territory in which you're operating? If you're ISIS territory, that's probably not a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Do you apply those rules? Do you apply international, do you internationalize those rules the way we deal with BITS? Or do you apply international notions that are, that can be coordinated with whatever you think there is a hodgepodge of Syria? And then you hold companies to it. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, there's not much, but it's complicity, and and you're absolutely right. Beyond that, mm -hmm. what you have is the Hague, and that yeah. enterprise is right, and so there's not much. So what there is is you guys working hard with the key apex. The the trick is to find the the apex multinationals in the chains that are critical. Here you've got construction, you've got trafficking, you've got infrastructure, you've got lending, is to go and put the screws to them using the magical words complicity. 
Um, you can throw out the words uh, international crimes, no one's going to care. But complicity hurts because there may be a legal basis, certainly in Europe, to then uh, create liability. And, of course, terrorism finance. Yeah, the financial action task force. Right, but, but you're right. There's Beyond that, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, all right, the ethics, monitoring and accountability. Um, <laughs> What John would say, John Ruggie would say as well, that's how the societal sphere works. This is not an answer, and I'm sort of mocking myself as I give the answer. Who do you look to? You look to consumers and investors. <coughs> so who's going to discipline you? The, the story I have is, oh, what's her name? Kathy Gifford. Y'all don't remember Kathy Gifford. Uh, she was a lady who was very famous in the U.S., had a, a coffee clutch talk show, um, for people between 9 and 10, and there would be a bunch of people, it's like The View, if any of you watch it, a bunch of people sitting around having coffee and just talking. And she then, of course, got the bright idea, I can make even more money by making house dresses. Do they still call them that? I'm showing my That's age. Um, house dresses, it's, it's horribly sexist and, and, and patriarchal, but that's what they were. So I would make house dresses for the ladies who, because it was that era, for the ladies who then watch me and I can charge a mint. And even better, I can do this by putting my factory in Honduras, and even better, I can do this by hiring six-year-old girls to <laughs> sit at <laughs> You see where this is going, right? And so she does this. And apparently she doesn't break any laws in Honduras, and the factory is, is all above board. The story breaks in New York, and within six months, Kathy Gifford is no longer on the predecessor to The View, and her company is bankrupt. That's the ideal model story mm -hmm. that we tell all of the kiddies about why this works in, in, uh, in the societal realm. Uh, we're not dealing with law, legality, or st but we're dealing with standards. But standards that, you know, whose the democratic deficits of which are, are enormous. We don't know actually which standard, other than the sense that people in New York who buy her house dresses really don't like the idea of seeing six year old girls working 60 hour weeks, and they're not buying them anymore. They can buy someone else's house dresses. And so that's the model. Um, is that enough? I don't know. Um, sometimes it is. Uh, there was uh, Victoria, you all know Victoria's Secrets, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Victoria's Secrets had a problem. They were using, you know, those bags that you all buy. I know, I know none of you do, but that you've read about the the famous bags that everyone likes to carry around. The I guess are pink, into which you put Victoria's Secrets. Well, <laughs> they were using old growth forests for building this, and an NGO <laughs> came and said, you know, that's not really cool. Maybe you should think about sourcing somewhere else. And Victoria's Secret told them to go somewhere else, <laughs> and they said, fine. And what happens next is that the NGO had enough money, they put out a series of ads. And they show a, uh, a woman in the prime of her physical beauty wearing uh, underwear, right, and holding a chainsaw. And the caption of it was, Victoria's Secret, <laughs> right, and this ad runs. Within a short period of time, these guys are called back and there's an agreement negotiated for uh, slowly phasing out the use of old, um, of, of old forest products and using recycled in the thing. So these are the stories that are put out. But for every one of these stories, right, there's a story of a, of a company that isn't bound to consumer markets that say, oh, thank you very much. I really like it. What you're saying is really cool. Eh, don't care. <laughs> And, and so this becomes an issue. Again, the beauty of law is that you don't have to worry about social judgments. This is mass democracy in action, right? We're talking about, oh, we have no democratic deficit here. The people are speaking with their money. The good news is, yeah, we have, demo we have no democratic deficit. The bad news is you may not like what the masses, how the masses speak, and if they're indifferent and you think this is bad because there's some overarching normative thing, you're out of luck. The people have spoken. And so that's... That's where we are now, and people don't like it. One of the reasons for the Comprehensive Treaty is, in fact, people don't like that you can't trust. Oh, should not be recorded, right? You, the the idea is you can't trust the masses, right? So we need standards. Um, so accountability, eh, maybe, maybe. Um, all right, the last one, and I'm I'm sorry, I'm, you're probably near the end of your tolerance for my voice. I am. Um, 
All right, so you've got a bunch of actors. What about uh, markets for control? And um, uh, will market principles undermine the market? Um, <laughs> maybe. All right, one of the interesting things, for example, is that part of the problem of regulating in the societal sphere is that indeed we had this huge, oh, I'm going to say it badly, so don't laugh at me, a huge sook. <laughs> He's like, so I got it yeah, right, right? That's correct. Right. A huge sook for what? For standards, third party human rights sensitive standards, which are then sold and marketed, again, no offense, by NGOs that are in the business of marketing these things so that they can make money to do their, their normative campaigns. And so you've got a lot of this stuff. One answer is, yeah, it'll undermine the market. The other answer is, well, this is the necessary process that we need to get to consensus, and eventually the market will throw out uh, um, the outliers and that everyone will be competing but delivering the same kind of product. So it's like breakfast cereal. So you've got now two competitors offering 50 different breakfast cereals, but at the end of the day, if I were to blindfold you and give them to you, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's the same product. Uh, on the other hand, it could undermine. And when you were talking about, last little thing, because I am running on, the real test now is going to be um, China's entry. What no one has seen is over the course of the last 18 months, the Chinese have decided, and certainly after the November elections, that now is their moment, that they can now re-stamp globalization and its foundations, including its democratic ideals, not with the imprimatur of Bretton Woods and the and globalization as developed by the wash quote unquote the Washington Consensus, but now do a Marxist Leninist version, a Chinese version. And so they combine its OBOR, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and their campaign now to internationalize the yuan to set up a new basis for globalized transactions and in that context indeed you have a real competition for vision about where and how social responsibility would fit in it is an enormously important part of the chinese view for example and it's an enormously important part of the chinese communist basic line but it presents differently and it proceeds from foundational thinking about the relationship of the state, enterprises, and individuals than what we have come to believe is quote unquote universal and, and Western. So that's where you're really going to see the, the markets uh, eventually, if, if this actually works out and then they're more or less successful, that's where you're going to see the real and actually, that's where global constitutionalism is going to meet its, its test. This is the one big actor that has not been at the table for any of this stuff. And now they're knocking on the door. Not in ways that, that, we, have, that, that we have found embracing, but now they're going to be knocking and they're going to be saying, I, you know, here I am and we've got to talk again. Um, but now we're talking from different power perspectives. But thank you very, very much. You guys have been extraordinarily patient.